also probably a lot of work. So thank you, Maher. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these things are a lot of work. Okay, great. So I think like we should probably like uh, get started, right? Uh, or do you, Maher? Do you should start like really on time, or wait a few more minutes? I think we have passed the time. I think we can okay. get started. Okay, so, uh, so let me just introduce. Uh, it's a pleasure to have here uh, Sean Main. Sean Main is like a professor of PCE at the University of Florida. It's also the, re the recipient of the Robert T. Pittman Eminent Scholar, Chair in Electrical Engineering. He's the director of the Laboratory of Cognition and Control and the Florida Institute of Sustainable Energy. So prior to joining the University of Florida in 2012, he was also faculty of PCE at University of Illinois, Urbana Champaign. Uh, and his research interests are broadly in the areas of theory and applications of decision and control, stochastic processes and optimization. Uh, and he's also has applied research focused on engineering, market, mm -hmm. and policy, and energy mm -hmm. systems. Uh, so he has many books, uh, wonderful books in Markov chains, stochastic stability, and more recently, like the one that he's going to be promoting today, Control Systems and Reform <laughs> and Learning and also many awards uh, on many of these topics. And in particular, he is a fellow of the IEEE. So Sean, thank you very much for accepting our invitation and the floor is all yours, yeah. Oh, great, great. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. And I mean, thank the organizers for this great uh, meeting. It looks just, it's just awesome. And, it's, and the topic is dear to my heart, obviously. I mean, those that know me know that I love dynamics of algorithms and, and Try to figure out, you know, out how they work. Um, the uh, I'm doing two things today. You know, so I'm going to go over this NURBS paper, which is ancient news now. It's a year old, <laughs> um, and uh, and shamelessly promote uh, my new book on um, reinforcement learning. So it's like an introduction to control systems, and uh, and more depth in reinforcement learning. And, and stochastic approximation, which are topics of today's lecture. So this is, the material today came out of the dissertations of these two recent graduates, uh, Ditya and Chuang, and a uh, present graduate student, Fan Lu, and a longtime collab collaborator, Anna Bushich. And then uh, this is just an image from Paris, <laughs> where a lot, of, a lot of research has been done. Um, yeah, of course, many thanks to my sponsors, and also the Simons Institute, who hosted a DT&I, and I, and also on a in 2018. A lot of these ideas really matured uh, during that time. Um, okay, so this looks like a ridiculous amount of material for a, what is it, a 40-minute lecture or something? Um, but I've done it before. I'm going to explain what stochastic approximation is. It's no big deal. <laughs> you know, the details are hard, but the main concepts are nothing. But there's some issues that I didn't really understand. And that really, I think when I've been teaching this the last 20 years, I've let some students down with some misconceptions I had. And I'm going to try to clear that up today, <laughs> make up my, my past misdeeds. Um, return to Zap, I'll explain what that means. And, uh, and then just some numerics. So this is not a big thing. But the fact that it actually works, you can actually have a theory for Q learning with neural network approximation. That's pretty amazing. Um, so I, unfortunately, I won't, if you don't know anything about Markov decision processes, you're out of luck. <laughs> but luckily, this will be more our foundations to support all that than really get into uh, details of control. Okay, so let's start. What's stochastic approximation? So um, most of you know this, but I'm gonna give my own take. Uh, <clears throat> we have a function of some parameter theta which is expressed as an expectation. And we want to find a root. And you know this comes up in optimization. It comes up in reinforcement learning, uh, as I'll explain. Um, and, uh, and basically, what one could do is say, hey, let's just run an ordinary differential equation and hope it's globally asymptotically stable. Let's call it an algorithm. Okay. Um, and that's not going to work in a computer, so you use an Euler approximation. Now, of course, you all laughing because running this would be incredibly difficult because computing that expectation could be difficult in each step of the algorithm. Um, or you might not know the distribution of W, things like that. So what comes to, uh, to the rescue is stochastic approximation where you replace 
the deterministic function of theta n with this random thing. And the, uh, the wn plus one here has the same distribution as w or converges to the distribution of w as n goes to infinity. All right, so that's what stochastic approximation is. And then what of it? Well, you can then just go through and define noise as a difference between the, the random function of theta n and the deterministic function of theta n. And what you find is that, you know, because of the fact that you, you have a step size here, which is small, it crushes the noise and this thing behaves just like an ODE. And there it is. That's a theory of stochastic approximation. <laughs> um, the whole point is, is that Euler approximations are robust to measurement error, you know, and there's just, it's, it's so elegant, the theory now. It's very easy to prove convergence of stochastic approximation given the tools that have been developed over the, the past decades. Um, so it's just convergence is easy. Rates of convergence, not so easy. <laughs> um, okay. So anyway, my favorite book is the uh, Vivek Borkar's monograph. Um, and here's a second edition that's gonna come out uh, this year. Um, so, so there you are. So there it is. That, there it is. So let's talk about rates of convergence because when you run this people, I've gotten, I mean, I've heard many times people say stochastic approximation does not work. And they're right. If you don't know what you're doing, it does not work. <laughs> It's, um, and I'll explain what, what that means. But so first let's go through what I would call the OD method, which is the opposite of what the, it's traditionally. So the OD method is, is uh, with the, the term is coined by Leonard Jung, says that I have an algorithm, let's analyze it using OD methods. I think he got it backwards. <laughs> I think that in practice, we design, we come up with it as distortion. Uh, sorry, everybody. There's a lot of noise, huh? Um, yeah, Zoom is not respect, robust respect and measure noise. Uh, there's, for some reason, there's a problem with internet on my end. Am I uh, audible at all? You are, yes. You. Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, so it's like okay. there's um, a little bit of um, noise in the, in the background uh, for some reason. Okay. I'm and I know it's not the headphones. I mean, I doubt it. Anyway, okay, so I'll keep going. So um, especially, yeah. Um, so so I, I would say, and Leonard, I think Leonard, you know, you probably agree with me today, that really should go the other way around. Do algorithm design in the, in the con continuous time domain first, because calculus is beautiful. You know, we get, a, you know, it, it's much easier than discrete time. Um, and then you might have to modify dynamics because, getting this exponential asymptotic stability, I mean, I'm sorry, asymptotic stability might be difficult. And this whole lecture is about how to modify dynamics. Um, I mean, most of it. Um, and then if, for example, this is what I promoted, which I now kind of feel bad about. If you take a gain step size of some constant over n plus one, then you can hope for this optimal mean square error convergence of one over n for the mean square error. And you can even identify the constant in that one over n convergence. But there's, a, but there's two huge caveats. There's one little caveat, is that you've got to make sure that this matrix here, one half i plus g times a stars Hurwitz, where a stars is the linearization at the uh, equilibrium. Um, that's not a big deal, because you know a star could be Hurwitz, and then you crank up the game. So it's not that big a deal, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna point out bigger problems in a moment. All right, um, but so that's the best rate of convergence you can hope for in, in general. Um, I mean, there are exceptions, but you also get a central limit theorem as well. But what's, what's, what always excited me, and it's, you know, it's, this is old, old news. This goes back to Lenny, to, to Kai Lai Chung in the 50s. Um, he did the scalar case and then it was quickly uh, uh, developed. You can actually identify this covariance matrix as a solution to a Lyapunov equation. And under certain conditions, it's not hard to, to prove this. Um, if, if F is linear and everything, it's, it's, it's nothing. It's a, it's a simple calculus. Um, and this, uh, the covariance of the noise is the power spectral density evaluated zero for this noise process. 
So it's a sum of the auto covariance matrix which is used for the noise. All right, so you've got, you've got a formula for it. But in practice, you won't compute this. You'll do repeated runs, you'll get a histogram, and you'll estimate the CLT variance like that. Okay. All right. Okay, so let me explain why I take it back that this is a good idea to use this uh, step size. And people who are practitioners have known this forever, okay? I just love the theory so much I get seduced, but I've missed something. And I'm gonna explain that. That's like, this is like 20% of my lectures explaining this. So it is true that if we, if we do things correctly, choose the gain properly, we're gonna get this uh, central limit theorem holding and also convert mean square error convergence. Um, and, but don't forget the comparison. When you know, we talk about Euler schemes, when we're doing Euler schemes, the time scale is the sum of the step sizes, okay? So this, I mean, a lot of you know this, but um, uh, maybe a lot of you don't. And the problem with this step size, you know, like one over n or one over k here, is that this is gonna grow really slowly. Um, so the point is, is that you might have that the ODE, you know, this is the same thing here. This, this solution of the ODE might converge ex super fast, exponentially fast to theta star, but this tau n goes so slowly that you lose that, that fast convergence, okay? And uh, so basically what happens is nonlinear dynamics makes things very difficult. I'm gonna give you a scalar example to point this out, and I'm gonna show you how things blow up with Q-learning. Just, uh, you know, just it's awful what happens with Q-learning, okay? All right, um, so what, what happens when you look at problems uh, carefully is that if you're far away from theta star for some models, you're gonna need a large gain. And when you're close to theta star, it might be much smaller or different. You, you know, this, the nonlinearities really make things complicated. And I'll explain this in example. So here's an example. So we have a, a loss function here, which is quasi-convex. I, I cooked this up just for examples, for example. So it's quasi-convex, but not convex. So creating descent would would uh, minimize this function. The minimum is zero. It's symmetric. Um, it's my negative gradient. If we're going to do a gradient descent, we'd like to do, uh, you know, you look at um, f bars minus the gradient of this loss function. And I, I designed this function so it's got a steep slope near the origin, which is theta star. But overall, it's got a much more shallow slope. And that's and that's what that's why you're going to get different preferred G's depending on where you are. Okay. And so here's, here's, here's a more general step size rule where um, one half is less than, rho is less than or equal to one. We'll look at that. All right. Okay. So what, what you find out with this example is that the best you can get is if you, um, if you take a, um, this is with uh, alpha n equals, um, g over n, you end up getting n to the minus 0.34 g just because of this miserable, uh, because it's tau n, the natural time scale grows so slowly. So this says you've got to take g you know, reasonably large. So you need g, say, bigger than a half approximately, to, to not a half, but a little, little less than a half, to get the, uh, the one over square root of n rate that you expect. But locally, because the slope here is, is four minus four, the optimal variance is with g star equals a fourth. So the, the optimal, if you choose the optimal gain in terms of steady state behavior, the transients will kill you, absolutely kill you. And I'll show you what happens. So here, here is, a, is a really fun plot. So I've run this for a million samples with three different step sizes. So again, I've got my alpha n equals g divided by n to the row. And I have three different values of row. When I take row equals one, which gives you the optimal variance, asymptotic variance, you see after a million samples, you only go 2.8 seconds <laughs> for the ODE. So if you, if you have an initial condition of 100, maybe that's what you thought theta star was. You initialized at 100. You don't get anywhere. And so you don't get anywhere near where you want to be. 
You know, well, if you use a smaller value of rho, you end up getting a larger Tn. Tn, tau n is the sum of the step sizes, where n is a million. Um, and if you take rho equals 0.8, you're just there. You know, you, you've, you've recovered completely from the initial condition. All right, so, so that's this tension between wanting a high gain for um, getting the deterministic dynamics to converge quickly, but you want lower gain to get good variance. Now, all of you out there, many experts out there are laughing at me because you know that this tension can be resolved. And that's something, um, yeah. there's something called polyacrupid averaging, where you basically use a small value of rho, say rho equals 0 0.8, which gives you, doesn't give you the right rate of convergence. But then if you average your estimates, you get the optimal uh, variance. So for the scalar examples, use polyacrupid averaging, it's done, it's trivial. Use rho equals 0.8, you're getting very volatile estimates, but then you average, say the last two thirds of your estimate, your estimates will have the optimal variance. So you get everything. You, know, you, you get the quick, um, you get rid of the transients very quickly and you get the optimal variance, all right? So one-dimensional example is trivial. <laughs> Questions? Ah, let's keep going. Now, let's look at an example where polyacrupid averaging doesn't work at all. So if you take tabular Q learning, I'm not gonna define it. You might've seen it in earlier lectures. It's just, it's a famous uh, reinforcement learning algorithm. And if you take the standard Watkins algorithm, um, it just is stuck. So I'm not even showing you that. Um, so the standard Watkins algorithm, standard gain, that you find in textbooks, this is, this is the error in the Bellman equation, you know, at each iteration. It just never moves. After a million iterations, you haven't learned anything. Uh, there's a joke thing here. There's a, my student Aditya Devaraj has a gain, which also apparently doesn't work. The Bellman error is still huge after a million samples. But if you, if you choose um, this value of one over one minus gamma with the step size one over n, um, it works re reasonably well. Okay. So you can use one over n. This is all with, you know, one over n. Why not use what I just preached, take rho over n to the 0.8 and use polyacrupid averaging. Well, it fails completely. And this is where rho equals 0.85, you can try 0.6. We tried 0 0.1 where the theory doesn't hold and there it works pretty well, but there's no theory to justify that. So, so the problem here is condition number. The A matrix has a single eigenvalue, you know, which is almost zero and all the other eigenvalues are out there. And the condition number just kills you. Um, now it, it turns out that the source of the error in the Bellman equation is really just due to that one eigenspace, the A matrix. And if you kill off that eigenspace, you actually get much better convergence. Um, and that's why, that's where the AD gain is right there. Um, and if you look at something it's sort of relative um, the Bellman error, you get fast convergence. I can't get into that, but um, um, but the condition number is what kills Q learning. And you really need some other way of thinking or you're just gonna get drunk, right? Oh, should I switch off my video? Somebody suggesting that. What do you think? I'll give it a shot. Sean, this really sounds like microphone uh, noise to me. This is like classic amplifier distortion. Um, can you hear me now? Is that yes. better? Is it better? Yes. Yes. Damn, yes. Damn Bose. It's, I mean, it's always worked before. Sorry. Okay. So there's another approach. Ah. That's too bad. And now, now this is why. Let's just wait for a second. All right. Um, so return. 
this is the return is, is because it was an audience that had seen this before. I'm going to explain what this zap business is about. So um, in Q learning, there's two issues that are widely recognized. Um, basically, there's no theory of stability of Q learning outside of the tabular setting and optimal stopping. It's a completely primitive area. And also, I, I'm not going to explain what it is, but the, the function that you look at in Q learning, like in DQN or any of them, it's hard to justify. People call it the projected Bellman equation. I don't agree. I don't think it's projecting anything. Sorry, I know there's a fighting words for some people, but I don't see the justification. Um, this I don't yet know how to solve. I mean, I'm still working on it. Um, but stability, um, and then you have know, this issue of the discount factor. I won't talk about that. Um, but um, basically what you can do, one thing you can do that we weren't aware of Smale's work, but the idea is if you have a root finding problem, make a change of variable. Can, uh, consider f of theta bar is a, is a variable. Right? We said theta is a variable. Let's make a change of variable, change a coordinate system, and call f bar of theta the variable. And here's our ODE. Why not? <laughs> All right, so f bar of theta is a variable. And let's just say, well, we want it to go to zero. That's the goal. That's a root finding problem. Um, if, if you do, if you have linear dynamics, then you know the solution of a linear ODE. It's initial condition times theta minus t. So we, we came up with this in 2017, 2018. And then Vivek Barker pointed out, hey, Smale did this, the ODE. Uh, Back, uh, back um, in the 70s. Um, and then a decade ago, uh, there was discussion in the continuous time domain of applications optimization. Um, but this is just for root finding. And nobody uh, came up with stochastic approximation techniques to do this. All right. So this, I'm going to stop for a second because this blows people's minds. Theta is not the variable anymore, it's f bar of theta. And anyone can say, hey, there's an ODE that converges to zero, right? All right. Now, of course, you also know there's a chain rule. <laughs> and so I can differentiate this, apply the chain rule, and I do get an ODE for theta two, all right? But what's beautiful is it's globally, it's always stable, you know, <laughs> because it's such trivial dynamics. So if you've got a root finding problem and you're having trouble, use this technique, it's awesome. Clear? Okay. So, um, so there it is. So the dynamics are that you just, from any initial condition, f of theta zero, you just travel in a straight line to zero at an exponential rate. That's the idea. It's quite a, it's quite funny. And um, so the stochastic approximation translation is what we call zap stochastic approximation. And there's a long history to that joke. And I won't have, have time to get into that. Um, okay, so here's so basically the actual ODE for theta, of course, for the chain rule, is just the uh, where well, a of theta is this linearization matrix we talked about before. Um, and so so basically you do the same sort of Euler approximation for theta, exactly as before, um, where I'm, I'm I'm taking this minus a inverse right there. You know, that and that are supposed to look the same. Now, of course, my estimates of A are just obtained online by using the same sort of stochastic approximation algorithm, uh, where A n plus one here is the observed linearization matrix at stage n. Okay. And this thing works if you design it carefully. So I want to be able to track this matrix gain. So I want my estimate here to approximate A of theta n. So I'm, I, have to, I have to chase theta n. And what does that mean? It means I need high gain here relative to alpha n. All right, and so that's, that's what's given right here. 
So the whole theory rests on the idea that you have high gain in the second equation, and there's a whole theory of two time scale stochastic approximation that under this assumption, you do get this uh, OD approximation. It just, it's just amazing, and it really works. And this is so robust, you can even handle non continuous F bar. <laughs> so in, in Q learning, F bar is not even continuous, but you can still make this thing work. It's, it's quite remarkable. My F bar is piecewise smooth, you can still make it work. You can prove things. Um, it's, it's incredibly robust. Um, now, I say always 1 over n, and I mean for the theory. I would still recommend maybe using, you know, maybe something bigger and then using polycoup with average. The reason for this, you get optimal variance. You know, but you can also get optimal asymptotic covariance by cranking up the gain and averaging. So it depends on the application. We have we have we found we haven't needed to do that, but I don't want to tie anyone's hands. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. And so again, stability is universal because the new your absence low is. Of course, you need some conditions, but even again for this paper that I mentioned, the NERPS paper, we managed to prove stability even though F bar was piecewise smooth and not and not smooth anywhere. So it's it's pretty amazing. Okay. All right. Um, so let's go through and um, and look at what QLearning is about. And for those of you who don't know anything about MDPs, sorry, you can you can just close your eyes for a bit. Um, so basically, um, this is what it, if, again. This is only for those who know about reinforcement learning. There's this temporal difference sequence. And we'd like the conditional expectation of that to be zero almost surely. And so this, you end up taking a, a, uh, a random vector, the same dimension as, as theta, and you want the expectation of that to be zero. And this, this, is, what's, this is what you get in DQN, for example. And it's uh, proposed very often in the literature. Um, the theory is a mess for that, um, but um, because when you, when you let zeta n depend on theta, um, and this is a theta n, um, it, really, it really makes things ugly. Um, but anyway, um, but this is what I'm saying. This is, a, this is what they call the project, projected Bellman equation. I'd love a discussion another time if anybody really wants to defend it. I don't really see any defense, um, except empirically it works. You know, I don't know why, but it's amazing how, how that success has been on using this criteria of fit for approximating the solution to the dynamic program equations. <clears throat> this is called the Q function in Q learning. I can't, I can't explain it. There's no time. Um, but um, Again, there's no theory to tell you if there's a root. There's no theory to tell you if the inverse of A exists, we haven't talked about. And again, stochastic approximation is really weak for a discontinuous ODE. I mean, it's really, really miserable. Um, there is theory, but it's hard. But we developed specialized theory just for this uh, ZAP stochastic approximation. So we're able to make it work. And we're able to justify it. Okay. Okay, so again, there's a video and, and a poster and all sorts of stuff you can see. All right, so I'm just going to wrap up with some examples. So um, again, I'm trying to solve this equation, and I am going to use the classic, uh, um, uh, you know, the standard thing that people use. Um, and I'm not being very clever with exploration; we're just putting some, you know, random nonsense. Oh, that's, that's right. At the end, we did. We did use the sort of a greedy plus noise thing. Um, but anyway, forget that. Um, but what we did is we just did, we wanted to check the robustness. And I'm, I'm, I, we didn't have failures. You know, so we, we would get, when we had smaller um, neural networks, the performance wasn't as good. You know, um, but we didn't ever see instability or any problems like that. Um, you know, you can see here we had 
a big range of behaviors. So the, the variance was pretty high when we had small neural networks. Um, and it was better behaved when we took larger neural networks. So this is now, you know, the different standard examples that people use for testing. Um, and, um, and it was very exciting to see that you could just, this was sort of plug and play. And I don't okay. think that's true for DQM. You know, can I don't. You can know. Sean, can you explain what are the different, uh, what the different colors means here? Oh yeah, yeah, so, oh yeah, yeah. So basically um, we did multiple runs. Yeah, so I should have done that. And um, so, I, you know, say we, we did, I don't, um, so I don't know why it's a 75 to 90, but 75 to 100%, we had really high rewards. And then 10 to 25 uh, had much lower than we'd hoped in these independent runs, okay? Um, and the median is there. Now note that the time horizon is very, very, very small. 3,000 to me is, is nothing. <laughs> I mean, it's just uh, incredibly just nothing. Um, and these other ones, I think we had to go larger, larger. No, no, not at all. Oh, just all 3,000. Jesus. So if you go to reasonable length, which would be more like 3 million, <laughs> um, then this would be compressed to nothing. Yeah. Um, so this is, that's really it. I mean, this, the fact that it really, the application matches a the theory is really awesome. And I don't think this is true of other methods. I think I, my feeling is that with DQN, people try and try and try. They finally get architecture that works. They publish a paper and say, yes, we're heroes. But again, I don't know because people don't publish failures. Um, I know personally, we never got to work. When we tried DQN with this architecture, it didn't work. Um, it just it blew up. It wasn't even stable, uh, at least with some of these. Um, OK, so that's really exciting. So anyway. Um, I'm on time. So reinforcement learning is cursed by dimension, as everybody says. It's conversed by variance, which I've always said. And I have a much deeper, better appreciation of the nonlinear dynamics than I used to. That, that really is an awful, an awful curse as well. Um, and condition number as well. Um, so second order methods can ensure stability and also optimal variance and use them when they can. And I'm not alone. I mean, Michael Jordan at Stephen Boyd's birthday party was promoting this as well in 2018. So <laughs> if Michael Jordan's allowed to say it, I'm allowed to say it too. Because, uh, you know, it's, it's like taboo to introduce a matrix in your algorithms. And that's because of uh, AlphaGo. People say, dimension's a million. Well, not my dimension. I'm not going to look at a million dimensional problem. I <laughs> forget it. You can do that. Um, and but also, some people might be able to figure out, I mean, computer engineers are pretty clever. They might be able to find ways to deal with it. Um, the, uh, I really, 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 really think we all need to work on getting rid of this paradigm of rejected Bellman error. I've got this convex Q learning that attempts to do it. I don't think it's the answer yet. Maybe something like it will. Um, and I think Zap and stochastic optimization might be awesome. I think it's just a matter of coming up with ways to make it numerically less um, complex. Um, and I've, I've got some of that in the book. I've got something I jokingly call alpha zero, Zap zero, <laughs> which uh, has, has complexity D instead of D squared um, per duration. And it seems to kick ass, but so far the theory is pretty weak. Um, but uh, you can see that there. All right, anyway, so more, um, yeah, um, forget about, I guess not much I can say about control variance, but, but I, I do need to shamelessly promote my book one more time. Um, it'll be on the shelves in May, until the latest. <laughs> um, but thank you very much. I'm open for questions. Hey, Sean, uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, there, there are a few, um, Questions in the in the Q and A. Uh, so Michelangelo Bean has a question. I think it was from the beginning of the of the presentation. So it's like plus if alpha n vanishes, then conversion is not uniform in the initial time. We have a vanishing conversion rate. Uh, this somewhat can be seen as a lack of robustness with respect to possible changes of theta star, which are followed slower and slower. Right. Well, yeah. Um, well, 
Yeah, the vanishing game, though, there's a lot of good motivation for it. Um, I mean, it's the optimal thing to do if that were linear. Um, you know, you get the optimal rate of convergence if you use polygrouped averaging. Now, what's the alternative? So the alternative people, practitioners usually use a constant gain algorithm and it's very hard to tune. It's, and, and then I, I would agree then, but though if you do make it work, what you end up with is that instead of getting convergence, you get convergence in distribution to some stochastic random variable, which is approximately Gaussian. And what you can do is then do the same sort of polygrouped trick as averaging the last things. And that might work. So this theory needs to be done to justify that. Is it any better? I don't see it. I don't, I don't know. I, I don't see, I don't, I, nothing's convinced me that that's, that, that gives you better performance. Uh, but ask me again in a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I, I guess like the, the traditional argument is that like beta star might change over time and therefore. Oh, maybe I didn't hear it. Oh, if beta star is changing, I'm sorry. I, I don't believe in online. So in advertising, <laughs> I believe in online algorithms. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but it's, it's too slow. Imagine trying to drive a car and learn at the same time. And then I, I, I just don't, I don't think, I think it's very, very, maybe it's a couple percent of applications will really be online. Um, so I'm thinking of this as, um, this is offline. And then maybe tuning, fine tuning online, sure. And then you'd want a, a constant gain algorithm. You know, if, if you're trying to adapt, slow, just slow changes. Hmm. Yeah. So um, there's also, Sean, like a, a question by John Barras, and it says like, uh, hi, Sean, um, you can use multi-resolution SG and the associated multi-scale stochastic approximation called for Borker in our work, uh, and you can resolve the problem. I'm not sure what the problem was. It's like, or if you like, uh, Look at the early work of Leighton, and Zisserman and have on handling um, graduated non complexity. Uh, especially, this method explains and similar techniques have been used by several authors to understand the essentials of the landscape of SCD in deep neural networks. Similar ideas apply to informal learning and deep learning. Comment, Sean Barrett. Oh my God. <laughs> I think that's referring to the comment in the beginning. I mean, um... what was that? I don't think, I, well, mean, the, 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 I mean, the issue of one over n is resolved with, with averaging. The issue of condition number, I don't see how multi-scale, I don't know, maybe I, I'm missing something. So I'll, I'll need more details, John. Um, if that really resolves the condition number issue, I'd like to see that. Because um, that's, um, yeah. So, so I actually have a, a question and I want to see like, if I understand this correctly. Uh, but so, so you started like arguing that there's this conditioning issue, right? Uh, but, but then like um, the solution does require to invert this uh, approximation oh, yeah. of the A star. So, so it sounds to me that, uh, how, how come I guess like you don't uh, run into numerical issues when you're trying to do this A, a inverse in, in your algorithm? Yeah, well, um, the um, blah, blah, blah. I guess like a related question on my side will be like, wh what is it of the problem that makes th this particular again value close to zero too? Do you know? Oh God, I'm sorry. It's, I'm having my, my stupid computer. You know what's happening is that, one second, I should have quit Dropbox or something. My computer's overheating. But so what's <laughs> that again? What's- uh, Oh, my, my, question? my question is like, I guess two parts. One is that, uh, what, what is it of the problem that makes uh, this eigenvalue close to zero, uh, like when you when you were discussing Q learning. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what is uh, it? What the hell does it mean? Take a look. I mean, um, let's go back and look at this. I mean, so what what's happening here, especially when you choose this particular value for zeta n. So zeta n is just a random vector the same dimension as d. You know, you would get this by taking the gradient of this, of this Bellman error squared 
by taking the gradient with respect to this theta, but not that theta. <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, uh. What, I mean, <laughs> why? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just that people, people motivate it as if they're doing gradient descent, and it's not. It's just not. And, and, and Sudden has said, so he'll call it a projected, um, a projected uh, DT equation, but I wouldn't agree with that either. If you're choosing this as, as a n, it's not a projected DP equation either. Even, I mean, he does say that, and I, I'd like to talk to him sometime because I don't know how you justify that. Um, it's a little uh, um, so, so there's other works that sort of, um, I guess, more like in, in deep learning that they sort of have like one of the cues to be like an older version of it, right? Like that's a, right. That's the QN does that. Yeah, and, and you can do a stochastic approximation analysis and prove that you're solving that equation. Uh -huh. It, yeah. With that delay, it, does. It, it freezes this to be an old guy, yeah, and then updates and updates. Well, then the end, the old and the new become they merge, and so you end up mm -hmm. the limit of DQN is this solution with the zero of this uh, equation. I, I will be interested to see, if, to see if you, yeah, if you have any, yeah, we have a proof in, um, in our NERVS paper. I think ah, okay, 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 that's um. Yeah. Um, and that's I why people the, say they're doing great descent, but they're not really. In the end, they're, they're really just doing this. So, you know, solving it. So, um, I, and I guess, like, my second question was about, like, uh, your matrix inversion of this A, and A, A hat sub N inverse. Uh, I, I thought that that's the matrix that is, like, poor condition. Uh, so oh, yes. Isn't that, that amazing? It still works. <laughs> I don't know why it works. <laughs> I, you know, it, we have a finance example with the dimension of 100 uh -huh. and the condition number, it, it's, it's singular. <laughs> and, and, we're, and we use, you know, basically we're using MATLAB's A slash B. Uh -huh. and, you know, we're, we're, do, we're doing A slash F. Um, and in MATLAB, it's insanely robust in Python, it blows up. <laughs> Um, but, if it, but, but it turns out you can prove that even if A is not invertible, there's a regularized version that's also stable. And you can use that instead. So that's what's so in the paper as well. So a question about this. So can we use something like quasi-Newton? Yeah. Oh, I, oh, I, oh, I, oh, I see. No, I, I don't yet. I don't know if there's any theory for that. I'd love it. That's something I, I, I wish I could get a, a stability theory for that. Wouldn't that be amazing? And maybe it's possible. You know, I just um, um, so, the so thing you, is that uh, it's weird thinking. You know, Newton Raphson itself is not globally stable. It's only the ODE, and and maybe there's a quasi Newton ODE that we could invent. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's, yeah, I mean, um, yeah. there, are, there are all sorts of fun ODEs to be to be invented. Um, I, I think I had, uh, I, I, I guess like, um, um, let's see if other people have questions. Uh, um, oh, okay. There's a question, I guess, saying, um, what if you invert A plus e epsilon I with yeah. epsilon small? That's right. So basically, we do that. So the, an alternative is to take gn plus one equals an approximate pseudo inverse. So mm -hmm, let, yeah. let me try, you know, it's i epsilon plus, oh, let's see, what would it be? That'd be, that's a transpose. And so therefore, that's a transpose, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, mm -hmm. and, and yeah, and, but we've never we found we don't need to use it, <laughs> even if even even if A is not invertible, uh, MATLAB pseudo inverse does it for you, um, which is what happens as you let epsilon go to zero. So this as epsilon goes to zero, that turns converges to the pseudo inverse, and we find the pseudo inverse. So that, I guess I guess you know, that's interesting. I mean, so we prove stability using this for any epsilon. Um, may, maybe we need to choose epsilon to be small. I don't remember. But but we never proved that the pseudo inverse worked, and that's mm -hmm. that's a mistake. We probably it, surely it does. I mean, if it's 
If the ODE is stable for any positive small epsilon, surely it's true for epsilon conversion to zero as well. Um, that's a, that's a get up um, in a bit more in my work. So. But this is so complex, right? I don't like using it, having to multiply all these matrices together. Um, because this, if you look at it in, in Q learning, um, this is rank one. You know, so uh, you can use the matrix inversion on this if you feel like it um, to get efficient updates. I'm not sure if it's really more efficient though. <laughs> A squared is, is already not that complex. You know, using the yeah. matrix inversion lemma compute the entire A inverse every iteration when you don't need it. You only need A slash B, A slash F, you know, all right down again. Um, this is like a, a comment. Uh, I, I, sorry, Miguel Angel, I, 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 I missed it. Like that's perhaps the regularization you mentioned. Uh, uh, What's that? It's it's a comment of like uh, that about the re regularization you mentioned. Uh, oh yeah. I guess like that's the question, but uh, yeah, I, I, I'm missing the the context. It's like. Is Michelangelo can give a little bit more of context of what was the uh, mm -hmm. the question. Um, so, I, I I have a, a, an an additional question of um, I guess like uh, it's it's two parts. So the first one is like uh, you you mentioned uh, about like what happens like maybe a clarification is like um, try to understand like when this is not differential and it happens like it, it's most of the time there. Yeah, the Jacobian is not differential, probably a theta star. So, so. Yeah. Oh, but, a theta um, star. Oh, then I'm dead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then you talk. Then you talk to Michelle Ben uh, You know. <laughs> but <laughs> your your argument is that as long as it's not a theta star, then like. Um, well, then we don't have a variance theory. There's no variance theory at all. Mm -hmm. um, and in in the in the proof for Zap Q learning, we really did need. We needed needed a smoothness of theta star, and, and for that we just needed a unique policy um, associated with theta star. Um, you know, unique minimizer. Um, yeah, so, I don't know how to deal with that. Yeah. And in general, if f bar is nonlinear, I mean, I'm discontinuous. You're out of luck. But we exploited some concavity. The fact that the nonlinearity. You know, I don't know. There's, there was a lot of structure, and the fact that the non nonlinearity comes from a minimum, um, it, it makes it gives you it gives you a lot of nice tools. Um, and I, I I do have like a a, a final question that is also related to this projected Dolman error. It's like uh, like. You know, like um, the motivation for 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 this type of like fixed point to me is like very clear for the theory and the tabular methods and so on and so forth. But once you add like uh, stochastic, uh, sorry, uh, function approximation here, it's like uh, I and you start to group like uh, states, many states into similar properties. Uh, I still find it hard to actually to to understand like yeah, is this meaningful for the actual problem? Oh God, yes! I mean, it's amazing. The fact that it works isn't it, isn't it incredible that this actually works. <laughs> you know, it really is. I mean, I I, I wish we knew why. It's a, it's a really a grand open question about why finding the root. So you know, obviously Rick Rick, Rick Sutton knows something I don't, because he's believed in this for um, forty years. He's passionately believed that this is the right thing to do. And so he, he has some intuition that, I mean, I'm serious that, that I don't. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I'd love to get in his head, you know, because <laughs> he really, he really had, he had a, a wonderful idea. Um, his initial I, papers, he would compare it to LMS. So I don't think that was a good motivation. But, um, I, I, I guess my, my, my question, more broadly, it's like, so, so if you think of particular simple problems based on, on 
on something like this. So there's, there's some versions where you can think of, okay, um, suppose I want to keep uh, like a certain region of like, you know, dynamical system type of problems. I want to keep certain region control invariant, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and arguably you could think of like uh, trying to, to basically define like a, a cost function that, you know, it's like mm -hmm. high outside your set, low inside your set, and then you try to do this. And, and my, my concern also with type of problems is that um, the invariant set is very particular and, and the control invariant set is also very, very particular. And an approximation of that set is not necessarily invariant. So uh, mm -hmm. it's hard for me to, to understand under what conditions to make. Solving this, you will get actually an actual invariant set. Uh, no. <laughs> no. I feel the same. I can't, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but it works. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, not, I, mean, I don't know for that particular problem, uh, but. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, no, it's funny. No, I, 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 yeah, I, there's more mystery than anything when it comes to RL. You know. Yes, let me see if, uh, if there's any other questions from the audience. Uh, or. Yeah, probably everyone missed the entire first half of the, of the lecture. It's a shame. No. <laughs> I, I, I think I think it was understandable. Uh, I, I I was able to, to understand. It was there was noise, mm -hmm. but um, uh, so I, I guess like going back to that example, like um, the argument is that like uh, like your like um, I guess like uh, Smale or Newton Raphson flow, like it's able to to change the gain as you go like in the different parts up and down, right? Um, well, the, the, yeah. I mean, well, well, for sure, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's one that's one way to think about it. But um, it's funny how my I. But the other thing is that um, you know, you know, this didn't. Here's the amazing history. So I, I, um, the reason I proposed where is it? Um, where is it? So, so the reason I proposed Raditya. And, and other students, Aditya was the first one to do it, this gain. I only had one reason, and that was to optimize the asymptotic covariance. Because you know that's been known since Paul Aiken and Rupert that, that A star inverse is the optimal matrix gain of all matrices. And so, but I told Aditya, I doubt it'll be stable. There's no way we'll ever get a stability theory. So it was really backwards. I was trying to optimize variance. It worked, and then we tried to come up with a theory to justify where, where it worked. And uh, and on our own, discovered what we were actually doing was the student reps and flow. Um, it's really really something. But you're absolutely right. You're changing the game is appropriate for depending on where you are in the state space. Yeah, the matrix game. Yeah, yeah that's 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 very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. Um, I don't see any other questions, so uh, I think we, we, we have five mm -hmm. minutes, so I'm gonna let like uh, half minutes of break before we, we introduce uh, our next speaker. So Sean, uh, once again, thank you very much. Uh, this has been very, very enlightening uh, talk and discussion, so uh, thanks for, for joining us. Anybody has any comments, and, and please criticism, share them with me, not just your friends. I'd really like to, uh, Get your insights, okay? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Thank I'll, you. I'll stop sharing. Let's see. Uh, Michael, do you wanna? Um, are you there? Do you wanna try to share your screen? Um, I'm here. Let me see if I can uh, turn my. Okay. So you see my video or my face? Um, yes. Yes, I do. I like your background. Is that what Maryland looks like this week? Or yeah. I heard it was a lot of snow there this week. Pretty much, yeah. Uh, um, let me, I don't know how to do this.
let me do this. Now you see, um, you see my PDF and or the terminal in the background. You see this? I, uh, we see everything, yeah. Okay, so let me, let me make that a little bigger, just a 